It's not very easy to get up here and talk about the experience that I had. Some people think you're crazy. You know, they say all kinds of things. But I know that what happened to me was real. I know that I experienced something. And because of it, God has a mandate on my life to stand up here and tell you about what happened. One year ago, today, 365 days ago, I experienced death. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, with all my heart, that I crossed into eternity. I know that something happened. The body knows things. And in those moments, I knew my body was shutting down and it was over. And so I think about Jesus and why he saved my life. I guess it's to talk about it today to you and to tell other people about my experience. It's not easy, but who am I if I don't say what God has mandated me to say? So I'd gotten to a point where nothing was working, and this last stint uh, about a year ago, the only person I would talk to was my cousin Will. He was the only person I would talk to. I had quit, I, I mean, I'd gotten to a point where I didn't even want to hear the word of God anymore, because you know what? It's not working. I've tried it. It's not working. So me and Will grew up together. We'd figure out every one of life's problems together. We'd sit around and talk about how we're going to become millionaires and share our dreams and all this stuff. But so anyway, I, I'd gotten to the point, and, and I just, I remember this time. And I remember Will was calling me because I, I don't know if he knew that something was wrong but I, he, he was calling, he was calling, he was calling. And I was out on a binge, y'all, with an obscene amount of drugs. And really, it was my death wish. It was my, my suicide is almost what it, what it looks like now when I was, I was planning my suicide. Because you know what? I'd become a prostitute of cocaine. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be like that. But it had complete control over me. When I thought about my life, when I thought about the things that I've done, when I thought about the pain that I caused, I couldn't bear it anymore. So I escaped through that. And even that wasn't working anymore. So I just thought I would keep using, keep using, keep using. And I had an ounce of, of drugs, and, I, and I'd gone off for two or three days. And I remember coming to this point uh, in my living room at my home where, I, I, y'all, I... I don't know how the human body can ingest so much poison and live because I had ingested so much poison. And I remember being on that in that in the living room that day uh, on the sofa. And it had been I had been gone up for two days and I had done so much of these drugs. It, it was just incredible. And I remember John wouldn't want me to. She wouldn't want me to come in the house with drugs because my kids were there. But I would come and I would hide them. Because I was an addict. That's what addicts do. Addicts are in bondage to it. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be like that. But that's what was happening. So I remember this time, I, and, and John was, she had gotten up to check on me. And uh, I was laying on the sofa, and she just, I guess she chalked it off as, he's, I don't know what to do. He's messed up again. He's out of it again. And um, the moments to come were both tormentive and glorious. As I sat and, and wallowed in the pain, it was like something was telling my something was telling me, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. And you understand, I was a professional drug user. I knew how much to do. But this voice kept edging me to continue. And I remember that voice just as clear as it is today. And when I did it, the moment I did it, I, I, I totally blacked out. And I was a drug user for 19 years. I never had one blackout. Not one time did I ever black out 
using a substance. And when I blacked out, I immediately went into another, what I believed to be another dimension. Now, my body was on the sofa at the time that I did it. And, but when, when, what I remember was when I went into the other dimension, I was running through walls. It was like, it had to be like 10 walls. And as I was running, my face was hit like fl flopping into these walls. And I, I, didn't, I, I didn't understand, I didn't know what was going on. But the next thing that happened, when I opened my eyes, John was standing in the, in the I was standing up and she was standing in the, the, uh, the casement of the bathroom and when I looked upon her face, when I looked into her eyes, I knew I was in trouble. And then again, I went out again. I think she, I don't know if I collapsed, uh, but she escorted me to the, to the bedroom. Uh, this, this all went on about 30 minutes before the ambulance came, and I'm going to tell you kind of the testimony before the ambulance came, because there were things that happened. Basically, I kind of went in and out. After that, after, she, after I fell in, in her arms in the bedroom, I immediately, have, has anybody ever seen the, the movie uh, uh, Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore? And how the, the shadows came around the bad guy and he like took him down? I mean, that's exactly what happened to me, exactly. And, and it was like four shadows now, all the while, she's looking into my eyes, and my eyes are open, but they're not blinking. To, I, I researched to be clinically dead means that your heart stops beating and you stop breathing. And that happened to me. I believe I had cardiac arrest at that moment. Of course, there's no doctors that can attest to that, but I know what I believe in my heart. I know what, I mean, you know, your body will tell you what, what's going on. And so... I see these four shadows, and they, they come and get me, and they take me down into this, it's like a tunnel, it's like a, it's like a shaft, and the walls are like clay, but they're like stone as well, and I remember on the, it was a descent, it was just like being in an airplane, and you feel the gravity, you feel yourself going down, it was exactly the same, and, and with the, you know how the force you feel when you're on a plane? That's how it felt when I was going down. And with their fingers, these demons had power over me. Just with their fingers. They didn't even put their hands on me. They just, like, moved a finger, and they had control over my spirit, man. And as I'm going down this tunnel, I mean, I know what's going on. I've heard people testify and say they didn't know what was going on. They were confused. But you see, I had known the word of God. I have had an experience. I know the word. I knew what the scripture said about heaven and hell. So I was not exempt. I was not confused. I knew what was going on. But at that moment, it was as if I gained a new understanding. There are capacities in eternity that you can't parallel to the temporal world or to the, to the earth. And, and this is what I mean. Your, your capacity of, fee, of feeling, you're 10 times smarter. Your senses are so much more acute. I just knew things. Nobody had to tell me what was going on. I knew things that were, were happening without any, it was like I gained a new wisdom. It's, it's like uh, the, the Hebrew, the Greek language to the English, English language. The Hebrew language has so many more words. There are more colorful dictations. Uh, as a parallel to the English language, in other words, the word love in the English language, it's interpreted with seven different words in the Greek language. So it's like that in eternity. There's so many more capacities for understanding. And so as I'm going down this tunnel, I'm telling you guys, great horror filled my being. Have y'all ever saw the movie Awake? Has anybody ever saw that movie Awake? where the guy is, is on the operating table and they're like planning his death and he, he's laying out 
and, and the doctors are like playing his desk. But for some reason, he never fell out of unconsciousness. He knew what was going on. And he's like, he's trying to scream, but he's because he's under the anesthesia, he can't do anything. He's just like, please, please, please. He's trying to get somebody's attention, and that's how I felt. I'm, I'm wanting to get somebody's attention. I know what's happening. I know what's going on. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about my wife, and I'm trying to get her attention. And I'm also thinking, she's going to think, what is that? It stinks. She's because I knew the word of God. She's going to think that I'm in heaven. So these demons take me into this, for lack of a better way to say it, it looked like a chamber. It looked like a, like probably a 20 by 20, maybe like a holding cell of some sort with the walls being stoned, clayish, but ironish. I, I, it was like a substance I've never seen before. And I remember it was like I had chains on me and I was put on display for the enemy. It's like I was being made fun of, or uh, getting ready to be made a mockery of. I didn't see the chains, but I felt them. And it was something that had my hands bound to the wall. And in, in that moment, I remember feeling such great despair and hopelessness. I miss God. There is no God in hell. There is no God in this place, this chamber. There was no evidence of love. There was no love anywhere. There was no hope. No hope. Just, just, just to think that you can get a, a moment of rest in the earth. You, you don't even understand how incredible that is, that you have an inclination of hope. Because you see, I lived as a drug addict. I thought there was no hope. I thought I was living in hell. But just being separated from God in this dark, dark place, that alone, I, I can't, I, it's like I just know something. I, have, I understand eternity. I do. I really do. It's seated in my heart because of this experience. I know about I know what it's going to feel like. I know how someone is going to feel when they go to hell. I understand it. I know it. And it's an incredible burden to carry, to know that. So I'm in this place. I'm in this chamber, and I'm, and I'm, too, I'm stuck to the wall. And I remember thinking this thought that there are going to be people here that didn't expect they were going to come here. You see, the scripture says the way to heaven is narrow, but the way to hell is broad. And, and so I'm there, and I'm, I'm thinking, that, man, people are going to be here. And I, got, I got so many thoughts going through my mind. It, it's just the things that happened to me just in, I, I think it was two minutes. It could have been, been a second. I don't know. It could have been, we, we calculated two minutes because Jean was on the other, and she kind of told me her side of the story, and so we put it together as it was a two-minute thing. So anyway, I'm, I'm in this place. You know, I could see my skin just like I had skin. I had a body, just like I had a body, but my skin was translucent. It was like, it was like invisible, but it wasn't. You could, you could still see it. It had substance, but you could see through it. It, it, was, it was, it's hard to explain. I mean, it's just no words to explain. But I remember on, on the wall, I could see inside of my, my belly right here. This is where your soul is. I believe your soul is right here. And in this area, there was a great dark. It was just dark. It was black. It was like a blackish gray color that was right here. And I knew what it was. It was sin. It was filth. And you see, because of that filth I had on me, that's what gave Satan's devils, Satan's demons, the right to come and get me. It was the contract agreement that I made with the devil that I agree with him and disagree with God, even though I knew God's word. Because I held on to sin, that's the sin of omission. I held on to sin, omission. I'm saying, God, no to you, and yes to my way, to my sin, and that darkness right here, gave Satan legal right to put me in that place of torment. I 
I just knew that. I was darkened. In my soul, I was darkened. Wow. Man, we can't play with sin. It's not worth it. Since that, since that experience, since that, since that revelation, man, I, I'm on guard. I don't let anything come in these eyes or ears. And if it does, I get it right quick because I don't play with sin. Because all it takes is a little leaven, a little bit to contaminate my whole body. And that's how we need to be as Christians. We need to be vigor. We need to be fervent. And we need to stand for righteousness and stand for what's right. Because let me tell you, there is a lost and dying generation out there that is going to hell. And they need to see something real in us that's going to make them want to come to Jesus. And let me tell you something. I had people watch me and look at me for years to profess Christ and then to go back out in the streets. And they said, I knew that stuff wasn't real. I knew it. Jesus stuff. Because we, as Christians, ought to carry the mantle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to carry it and wear it right and wear it well. Because so many years we haven't done it right. And we've given them a, a false Christ. And we've, we've showed them things that are, that are not who our God is. My God is a God of love and compassion. And he has power to set me free from sin. And we need to see him for who he is. And people need to see us and see him living in us for who he is. <clears throat> I felt this presence come up to me while I'm in this place. And it was the presence of sin. Now listen to this. In this moment on the wall, there was something breathing on me. And I have never felt so filthy in all my life. The smell, there's no way I could describe to you the smell. The filth, every AIDS, sin, cancer, perversion, child pornography, every evil thing that you could imagine in your mind that man has imagined was alive and it was breathing on me. It had its being. It was alive in hell. It was ready to consume me. You see, the, I had pain in my heart. I just feel like I need to say this right now. I had pain that came into me as a, as a child. I had trauma in my heart that was never dealt with. And that pain of abuse caused me to go all the way to the place of hell. Let me tell y'all something. It's very serious that we allow the Lord to heal us of our pain because that pain, the very thing that Satan put on you will take you back to his place. Because you see that pain is, is the doorway to his entrance in your life and ultimately to take you to this place called hell. So this, this being was breathing on me and I remember feeling so filthy And in a moment, while this thing is happening to me, I feel like God allowed me to feel this pain, guys, that I could not describe. If I tried, I couldn't exaggerate what I felt because there are no words to, to describe the pain that I felt in this moment. I could literally feel between, I could feel, you know where the toe cheese is in your toes? <laughs> I could literally feel between my toes. I was hurting everywhere, all over my body. I could, I could become one with my hair follicles. I, could, I was hurting so bad. It was like a fire was on me. I did not see a fire. I didn't see a flame. But, guys, I was in so much pain. I remember, God, I was thinking about my, when I was having kidney stones and, and how painful those are. But it was a thousand times painful, more painful then a million times more painful. I can't even describe to you. It was like if someone was ripping flesh off of your body. It was like as if you were dipped into acid. Has anybody ever had acid exposed on their skin? And that wouldn't do it no justice. For a moment, I felt this incredible burning all over my body, the sensation 
like I've never experienced in this world. The pain of hell. My God, if that's what's waiting in hell, if that is really what the, the end of the people that say no to God, oh, my God. My God, help us, please, Lord. I, I was really shocked to see God as a God of judgment because I've only known him as a God of mercy and love. I've only known him. I've only knew him to be good. I've never seen the judgment side of God, that God is going to judge sin and that it's going to be very pain. I, words of uncomfortability, that's, that's not even it. It's so much far beyond un, being uncomfortable. It is torment. It is torment. Torment everlasting. It will never end. It will never cease. Imagine your friends being in this place, your loved ones, the people that you, you love with all of your heart, yourself. Imagine those that are dear to you being in this place. You know, I look at people, and that's the, when somebody dies, it's the first thing I think about. I can't get it out of my mind. All I think about is heaven and hell. That's it. Bar none. That, that's all I'm interested in for my personal life is that I'm going to make heaven and that I'm going to bring as many people as I can with me. Because let me tell you something. I believe the heart of the Father, the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that not one person would ever go to that place. He doesn't wish that any one of us go there. You see, hell was made for the devil and his angels, the scripture declares. It wasn't made for us. God created us to love us. He created us for us to love him. And those that say no to God, there's a place called hell. And I tell you, it scares me. It really scares me. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 3, the sorrow of death compassed me. And the pain of hell got a hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. This is in the Bible. Seems like some, some of the patriarchs experienced something like what I experienced. The Bible declares that there are different levels of hell. I believe that. I was in this holding cell, and I, I really believe that there was more to come. I, I was not in the... The fullness of, I was just, a ta I couldn't have handled anymore. God couldn't have gave me, I would have, it would have crushed me. I would not, I would have been a basket case if I would have came back and would have saw. I just know I couldn't have handled it. As it is now, I can't go anywhere. I mean, if I want to rest, I got to go home. I can't be around people because when I see people, the only thing I'm thinking about is, do you know the Lord Jesus? Do you know him? But I believe there are different capacities and compartments. I've read stories and uh, testimonies from Mary Kay Baxter and uh, Bill Weiss. Um, uh, Kenneth Hagin had a, uh, experience with hell. Many, man, I, there are, if you go out on the Internet and you search, you research hell, you'd be surprised. I mean, there are so many testimonies about hell and the things that people saw. And, uh, you know, guys, I, I don't believe people are going to make that up. I, I'm not going to stand. I'm a professional. I own a construction company. I have employees. I'm not going to, I don't have nothing to prove. This ain't about me. I don't want to come up here and sound like a flake. That ain't what I want to do. You know what? I, I, this ain't about me. I don't know why anybody would make something up like that. To stand before a congregation and say, hell is real and that I experienced this and, and for it not to have happened. Wow. I believe when people say they went to hell. I believe those testimonies. Why would somebody make that up? The Bible declares different aspects of hell. There's the cast out, separated from God, and total darkness. It declares, and there's even a part that Jesus talks about, he says, where the worm never dies. And I heard a testimony of a lady who actually experienced the worms these worms, they go through the cavities of the beings, and they come in and out. They come out of your mouth. They come out of your ears. They come out of your nose. Um, Jesus even spoke about it in the gospel. He said, where the worm never dies. And, there, and with the testimony of this lady 
was that these worms would just eat, they would just enter and they would, God, can you imagine? My God, I can't stand a worm. I can't stand maggots. I mean, I hate them things. I mean, the worst thing for me would have been uh, if they would have put them little slugs. I hate them slugs, man. Them little slugs, they make, they make me mad. I manifest on them things. You know how you pour salt on them and they like, <laughs> But why, that would have been like my worst hell for me if they would have had slugs come in. I, anyway. Psalm 86, 13, for great is thy mercy toward me. Thou has delivered my soul from the lowest hell. In just a moment, in that place of torment, in that place of utter despair and hopelessness, I heard these words, and I believe these to be the words of God. This is your last chance. This is your last chance. And it was said with so much authority and so much vigor, it was said in such a way that you knew it was Daddy God and he wasn't playing. This is your last chance. I heard those words. This is your last chance. And immediately I came back to and I saw my wife. This is your last chance. You know, just those words alone to think, as a drug addict who messed up and fell back and turned back into sin so many times, how in the world am I going to go and not use drugs again? How could this be my, this is like that, y'all, this is like the Hail Mary. Y'all, I mean, it's like the flankers are going out. The only way I'm going to make it is if, this, I mean, this is fourth and in, in, in like forever and with one second left on the clock. And you got to hit the Hail Mary to make it. That's how I'm feeling. This is your last chance. What do, you, what do you mean, God? I don't get no more slips. God, that's it. It's over with. That's it. Wow, just that alone, that alone was enough. But I entered into the stage of what I call the aftermath of the moments to come. <laughs> By this time, I, well, when I came back to, this is a very important thing, I was screaming to the top of my lungs, screaming. John said she's never heard anything like that ever in her life. And I was screaming, get them off of me. Get them off, get them off, get them off of me. And I was fighting. She said I was fighting the whole time. I was fighting. Like even when I, it was like I was fighting. It was like I was fighting to live, y'all. I really was fighting with everything in me to not, I just knew that if I wouldn't fight, if I would have gave in to it, if I wouldn't have fought, it was like I knew what was going to happen. I would have never came back from that place. It would have been forever. It would have been over. And so I, I began to scream that, get them off of me. And, I, and, and, and just I, I'm screaming to her about hell is real. And by this time, the paramedics and the police are in my house. And I'm grabbing the cop and I'm saying, dude, hell is real. Hell is real. And the paramedics, and I'm saying, like, hell is real. He's like, just count, just count. One, two, three, four. I'm like, dude, hell is real. And so the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, everybody, I, I must have told 50 people from the point where the paramedics got me to the emergency room, even called a judge on the phone and told him what happened to me. And he was really interested and wanted to know more. Um, and but then at, at one moment, Butch gets to the hospital, Pastor Butch, and uh, he's like, Kevin, shut up. They about to put you in a straitjacket. <laughs> and he's like, you're going to get your chance to tell it. That's enough. But I had a little, one of the police officers, he, he sat at my bed for like two hours. And I, I just know that he believed what I told him. I know that he knew what I was saying was the truth. And he, and he just wouldn't leave, and he's just sitting there. And uh, I got to see him a few months later and, be and just begin to share with him. And I wanted to invite him to come tonight. I didn't, I mean today, and I didn't think about it. The, the following days, the next three days, um, I experienced, it was, it was very hard for me. When it got dark outside, I got very fearful because I had been in this place of darkness. I was so scared of the dark. I mean, I'm like, John, what are we gonna do? It's getting dark, put the shades up. Let's, I mean, I, I'm like, I, I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. I was so afraid. I would have moments that I would just 
break out shaking. I would just get so scared thinking about hell and thinking about what just happened to me. Why? Why did God spare me? It scared me so much. And then, you know, the upcoming weeks, I would get around. I remember going to a restaurant, and this one waitress had come up to me to take my order. And I, I literally, when she walked up to me, I felt that, that thing I felt breathing on me. I felt it in her. There was something in her. And I, and I wanted to throw up, and I felt sick. And so since that time, I've had all these I mean, these phobias and, and just experiences with, with, I'm just not normal anymore. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just not. And I got to tell everybody about Jesus. I'm going to say a few scriptures about hell. 2 Samuel 22, 6, the sorrows of hell come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. Psalms 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. You ever heard that? The wicked shall be turned into hell. Proverbs 7, 27, her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 15, 24, the way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. A wise man thinks about eternity. Why is it that we as human beings and Americans, we prepare and we plan so much in this earth, we're planning for our children's scholarship, we're planning for... All right, we're making investments, and we're planning our little life out, but we don't plan for eternity. A wise man plans for eternity. I'm here to tell you, you need to get your insurance policy. You can ask Leslie a little bit about an insurance policy. You better have it, and it better say Jesus on the top. You better make sure you're going to the right place. Because the place I experience, you don't want to go there. Isaiah 5, 14, therefore hell has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. Bible says in Isaiah 14, 9, Hell from beneath you is excited about you to meet you at your coming. Matthew 5, 29, And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Let me tell you how serious Jesus was about it. He said it'd be better for you to lose a limb, to lose an eye. If it's causing you to sin, a sin that you can't get out of, it would be better to cut your hand off than for your body and your whole existence to be thrown into hell. We need to get, we need to get forceful and vengeful about sin in our own lives. That's what Jesus was saying. He's saying be extreme and be radical about sin in your life. He said because that sin will bring you to hell. Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy the soul and the body in hell. God has all power. And what I'm looking at right now, I'm looking at a bunch of healthy bodies, but each person in here has a spirit man. And that spirit man is going to live forever in one place or the other. The Bible declares to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, indicating that there is no in-between place. There are many other scriptures that that uh, signify that or uh, exemplify that, but we are going to live eternally somewhere the rest of our lives. Where are you going to live? Will you hold on to the things you want above the things that God wants? How far will you let Jesus pry into your life? I think we know with things that besets us and keeps us from the fullness of God. You see, when you say yes to sin, you say no to Jesus. 
That's the fact of the matter. When you say yes to yourself, you say no to Jesus. It's not about me. It's noth- it is nothing about me. I just want to live for the Lord. That's it. I want to live for him.